Thank you very much, Stan. It's great to be here in this beautiful, beautiful room. Let the circle be wide round the fireside. And we'll soon make room for you. Let your heart have no fear, for there's no strangers here. Just friends that you never knew. We will travel along on the wings of a song with a mind that is open and free. If we close our eyes to the other side, we're just half of what we can be. So let the circle be wide round the fireside. And we'll soon make room for you. Let your heart have no fear, for there's no strangers here, just friends that you never knew. Very often people end songs at home, not by singing the last line, but by speaking it. Because the old people believe that when you sing a song, it brings both the singer and the listeners into another place. So you would say the last line in order to bring everybody back gently to the earth again. I grew up on a small farm with my parents and brothers and sisters. My father played the fiddle, my mother played the accordion, and people would come in at night to sing songs, to tell stories. But we came from a very divided world, and uh, the people who came in very often had big differences in politics and religion. But whenever my parents played music, you could see all these feet tapping to the same rhythm, regardless of their political persuasion or their uh, religious affiliation. And I realized, even as a child, that music was something that could somehow connect up all the secret and the sacred things within us in ways that we didn't quite understand. And also, something like music could release or unlock certain powers within us that sometimes we'd not be there if there wasn't a song been sung. And I noticed that very much as I grew up and uh, the troubles got worse and people stopped talking. And if a song was sung, somehow something would happen. So I'm talking a little bit about Ireland and the culture and the music and the importance of that in a divided society, like the society I grew up in. And the week before Easter, in 1998, I was driving along a small country road in the County Down, in the north of Ireland, where I live. I grew up near, well, I grew up near places. Uh, because if I told you where I grew up, you wouldn't be any the wiser, because it wouldn't be written on any map. So I usually just say I grew up near places. I grew up near the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, or as we Catholics would call it, the North of Ireland. Different thing. I grew up 40 miles from Belfast, 60 miles from Dublin, but six miles from the town of Newry. But before we could get to Newry to go to Dublin or Belfast or Monmouth, we had to walk three mile to catch a bus because the buses didn't come down the Ryan Road. It's too narrow. But we had plenty of time to walk and we had plenty of time to talk to. And whenever things get bad and people said there's no use in talking, we'd play music instead. And I play you a jig that my father learned from his father and he taught to me and that my son 
might come up and play with me now for very good. It's my son Finan Science. <laughs> What will, we, what will we play now? Oh, yeah. How much fun would that be? Try, try a bit of the, the <laughs> You're allowed to dance if you want. Internally or externally. <laughs> Anyway, I was coming along this road, driving the car, and I was singing a song into myself. And uh, you can have a wee break, come on, we'll I'll just try to do this with this one. I was singing a song that I'd just written the night before. It went something like, carry on, carry on, you can because I'd just written it the night before. I sang it to a few people at home. But today, that day, I was singing to a lot more people. The talks were going on in the Parliament buildings in Stormont. It was a week before Easter. And the talks had faltered. The politicians had come to an impasse. And the people in the houses all around were very worried because after 30 years of violence, many people had been killed. People were hoping that there would be a peaceful resolution to it. And for years, it is like watching the two sets of politicians. It is a little bit like two buses meeting in a narrow bridge and neither driver wanted to give way because he didn't want to let down his passengers. And it was only when the passengers would get up and go to the driver and say, look, it's all right, you can go back a little bit because we all want to go forward. It was only then that there was any chance of the political landscape beginning to change. Inside, the politicians were in parliament buildings in Stormont in Belfast. The TV cameras had interviewed the politicians before they went in for the talks, but then they wanted to interview just about everybody who disagreed with the talks. Because television can't deal with peace very well. If you put a cam C in a blue sky on a television screen and hold that shot for more than five seconds, people will be getting their remote controls, searching for storms. Because television is about moving pictures. It doesn't work if it's still, if it's peaceful. 
And when the man in the news says, here is the news, it's not really the news. It's a few carefully selected pieces that attract the eye of the viewer and the purse of the advertiser. And we decided to create a storm for the six o'clock news. So I got in touch with this man that Stan had mentioned, Vedran Smilovich. Smilovich played in the symphony orchestra in Sarajevo. And during the siege, he played out on the street during the bombs. And a CNN reporter had gone out, and there's a famous news piece. He went out to Smilovich and he said, Mr. Smilovich, are you not crazy for playing your cello while the shell Sarajevo? And Smilovich looked at him and he says, you ask me, am I crazy for playing my cello while they shell Sarajevo? Why don't you ask those people who are shelling, are they not crazy for shelling Sarajevo while I play the cello? And the whole idea about a culture of war is something which comes across in the media all the time, comes across in history books. But the culture of peace is rarely taught. So how could you expect anything else to be happening when all this type of thing is going on? So anyway, all I was going on my way to Stormont, when in front of me I saw three men on the road with guns. And it was a roadblock. And another type of thing came to my mind, another song. Someone died on Sunday, the funeral was today. Tonight there will be trouble, someone's going to pay. Don't go out tonight, love, it's better that you stay. For anything can happen in these troubles. You might be dressed in uniform, respectable and clean. You might be dressed in anorex and ordinary jeans. But murder is their mission in the night on scene. Anything can happen in these troubles. I've written that song about several types of events and occasions like that where people have been killed on the road. But after a while I realized I was going to be all right. One of, there, there were three policemen, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which is 95% Protestant. And uh, the relationship between Catholics and the police force wasn't very good. But I rolled down the car window, and the policeman come over, and he says, are you the son of the man that pulled my granny out of the coffin? I thought that was a strange question. The first questions have been easy. What's your name? Tommy Sands. It's easy. Where are you going to? Stormont. What's taking you to Stormont, says he? To sing, says I. To sing, says he. To sing, says I for the talks, the peace talks. And have you permission, he asked. Yes, I said, from the American man, George Mitchell. Somehow I knew that even though I had permission from the top, this man on the bottom was going to make the decision whether I would go there or not. It wasn't the first time I had been stopped at a roadblock. During the civil rights movement, I had been stopped many times for as long as it would take for the rally that I was supposed to be attending to be finished. And I thought he probably wouldn't want the talks to happen because of his word from the Republicans, from the IRA groupings, that they would disband the RUC because they were a very Protestant force rather than a mixed force. So I thought he wouldn't want me to go there. And at this time, Tony Blair and all these people, Bill Clinton was on the phone every day, Jerry Adams, David Trimble, all these people were meeting at Stormont. I wanted to be there too, but this policeman had his ear in through the window of my car, wanting to know if I was the son of the man that pulled his granny out of the coffin. And then suddenly, out of the blue, he started to sing a song. 
It's 11 by the clock, and I've only on one sock. The bike's punctured, so you understand my rush. I'm for the town today. Stand back and clear the way, for I've got to catch that half 11 bus. I says, how do you know that song? It's the first song I'd ever written. He says, because I learned it from you when I was a child. And suddenly I remembered a toe-curdling experience one night when we went to a wake. It was his granny's wake. My father had gone to play the fiddle at the wake because he often went to wakes, and I still do too, to play a lament for the person who dies. And the sad songs were never meant to make you sad. They were meant to take the sadness out of you. But he played a tune, and then he says, I'll go over and I'll say a prayer for you, because even though you were one of the other sort, a prayer will do you no harm. And he knelt down, and while he was in the ground kneeling and praying, there was no harm been done to anybody. But when he went to get up, he reached up, cut a hold of the coffin, and the coffin came over a bit. She didn't come out of it, thank God. But I said, is that the moment? It is, says he. But sure, we knew your father well. He was a good man. I says, it's 40 years since I've seen you. He says, yes, we couldn't talk very much during those days. He says, I hope you succeed in what you're going to do. And he shouted up to the other police. He said, let this man through. This is a song man. And that's the name of the book that I wrote, which is called The Song Man. But unfortunately, I don't have any here with me, but you might come across it sometime in your travels. But I went on up the road singing this song, and I had to have a verse for all the problems that the talks were bringing up. Ian Paisley, for example, the extremist leader from the, the unionist side, the loyalist side, and the extremists on the Republican side as well, they said, compromise is treachery. You shouldn't be talking. Don't betray your children's birthright. That's a right to stay alive. For there is no greater treachery than to watch your children die. Carry on. Carry on. You can hear the people singing. As I carried on up the road towards Stormont, my mind went back down the road to the house where I grew up and the importance of music there. I remember I had an uncle who had been in China in prison there. In fact, he was a prisoner of Mao Tse Tung. He was the only Irish man in Mao Tse Tung. But when he came back home, his mind was gone. And, uh, he stayed in our house and used to wake up in the middle of the night crying in Chinese because he thought he was still in prison. And then a man came called Brian O'Higgins, who was a writer and a, a very interesting man. And he came into my uncle and he started to sing a song. A storm a cree when you're far away. From the home you will soon be leaving And it's many's a time by night and by day That your heart it will be sorely grieving And at the end of the song Whatever it did to my uncle He realized he was really back home And the dreams and the nightmares stopped And I realized just how important that song was. I suppose it was around the fireside, like this here, not as grand as this, 
We had a small house, small farmhouse. We didn't have electricity nor running water. Well, the only running water we had was running to the well with a bucket for it. Or as my mother used to say, take two, it'll balance you. <laughs> but a lot of the songs and stories that were told around that fire was what was very important for me growing up. My father used to say before we went to school, he said, before you go to school and learn what's written in books, you have to learn what, is, what happened before books were written. And he used to tell us some of the old stories that were handed down and written down by the monks in the 8th century and around that time. Because before that, no history was written down. It was handed down in songs and stories. So I learned a lot of the early history through songs and stories. And uh, I wrote a song recently, which is on an album called Arising from the Troubles, about the, the very early days and a lot of things which contradict the, the uh, conventional wisdom of the history today. There's one now. Uh, I'll sing a song of Erin of the land Malaysians and Dittanen helped to win her hand They couldn't beat each other but agreed to share her name That story was recorded when the Christians came Well, when the Christians came to Ireland St. Patrick he arrived and before he came, Ireland had a kind of a different type of religion, sort of a Celtic spirituality, more akin to what would be regarded as the religion of the native people of the United States and many other peoples. And uh, God wasn't up there. God was in the wind, in the rain. God was everywhere. And because in the early days of Christianity, whenever they were trying to figure out what direction to go with religion, there were two main proponents. One was Augustine of Hippo, and he was a Roman, so power was up there. Ireland was never Romanized, so there's never that feeling of power coming from up there. So there was no money going back to Rome much. There wasn't much time for bishops in that situation. So, when Pope Adrian of England became Pope, he decided to centralize things, and this problem about Ireland was there. And he said the only way to bring Ireland under Rome is to invade them. So he issued a loud abilitor, and it was it's a papal bull. Uh, called the, the Lord Builder, which g gave permission to Henry II to come from England to Ireland to take over in the name of Rome. So the church became more Romanized. Then Henry VIII, of course, who was having trouble with wives, he decided to become Protestant. So then Ireland was told to be Protestant. So all this was going on completely outside of the ordinary people of the island. Then Ireland became a security problem for England because Spain and France were Catholic countries and they were trying to come into Ireland to attack England. So Ulster was planted with people from England who were loyal to England and loyal to Protestantism at the time. So. Whenever that happened, a lot of people, native people, lost their land and went into the hills and mountains. And in many ways, that, still, that conflict has still been played out to some degree. I remember a Catholic laborer on a big Protestant farm. He straightened up his back in the middle of the work and he said to the, the landowner, he says, how did you get this land? And the farmer says, I, um, I got it from my father. And how did he get it? Well, he got it from his father. And how did he get it? Well, he got it from his 
great, great, great grandfather. And how did he get it? Well, he fought for it, fair and square. Well, says your man, taking off his coat, do you mind if I fight you now to get it back? And in many ways, that's what justifies a lot of conflicts. In Ireland, we discovered after a while that we couldn't beat each other. One of the earliest stories that I remember my father telling, and looking back at the old history, part of it was, was mythology, part of it was true, but very often mythology comes before science, and then they go hand in hand after a while. But one of the early battles, and I think very often looking back at history, I think sometimes facts can get in the way of truth. Truths are more important. And the truth of a battle between the Malaysians and the Dedanan was they couldn't beat each other, so they decided to divide Ireland in two. The Dedanan were the spiritual people of the early days, so they owned what is below the ground, and the humans owned what is above the ground. So they came to an arrangement. Now that was something that couldn't be done in Northern Ireland for years because one tried to beat the other. And that's what that Good Friday Agreement was about. On my way there, I also remembered how the, in the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement began. We thought we had democracy, but it was in a divided society where a majority is ruling over a minority. It's majoritarianism, it's not democracy. It's very different. It's a little bit like three wolves and two sheep having a democratic vote as to what they should have for supper. <laughs> it's only when everybody is involved in the decision-making process that things work anywhere. If people feel that their vote won't change anything, they don't vote. So there's something wrong. If people don't vote, there's something wrong. It's not democracy. It might be majoritarianism, it might be plutocracy, whatever it might be. But during the 60s, there was a civil rights movement, and uh, everyone went out, out in the streets to demonstrate for equality between the nationalist Catholics, Republicans, and the unionist loyalist Protestants. And Many Protestants joined in because they realized that the only way to get peace was that everybody had a fair share. We'll sing it all over, we'll sing it down under, we'll sing it wherever we can. In mountains and highways and valleys and byways, we'll sing it all over the land. movement and it went very well for a while until one day in January 1972 they were walking they were talking they were laughing they were singing they were singing off a better future dawning Hope was on the banner that was flying in the air All upon that Sunday, bloody Sunday And as the years roll on I still can't believe you're gone They were walking 
with their lovers They were talking with their friends They were dreaming of a brighter future dawning But who would know the darkness would descend upon their dreams All upon that Sunday, bloody Sunday A gunshot on a burst of blood, sweet Jesus Someone cried Lad of seventeen is lying dying And thirteen more would follow him Before the day would end Curse upon that Sunday Bloody Sunday And as the years roll on I still can believe And they were laughing, they were singing Calling for a better future dawning But now it was a flag of blood Left hanging in the air All upon that Sunday, bloody Sunday People said, the IRA were right You only can talk to Britain through the barrel of a gun a lot of people went to join the IRA. I did too. I went to a man that I knew was, was in the IRA, and uh, he said, you, have, you must go to see this other man. You'll meet him at a bar at a certain time. I went there, and it was just the barman and this friend of mine who was always asking me to write songs about peace. And I didn't want this gunman to come into the place when this friend of mine was there. But I read it and I read it, and after almost an hour, nobody came. So I was almost relieved in a way. I went to walk out, and this friend of mine said, hey, where are you going? I said, well, I was to meet a man here, but he's not here. He says, he is here. And I didn't realize that this friend of mine was one of the recruiting people in the IRA. And he said, so you want to shoot people? I says, no, I want to stop people being shot. Is there any other way of doing it? He said, I didn't think there was, but I was hoping that you would. And he went into the back of the bar and he gave me a whiskey. I didn't even like whiskey. I drank it. And he says, never let me hear you talking about guns again. And he told me to write a song, which I did. And afterwards, somehow I realized how easily it is to get involved in a violent situation. And very often we look at so-called terrorists and uh, people don't understand them. But if people are given no other alternative, this happens everywhere in the world. So I suppose that more than anything else made me want to keep doing this. But anyway, I was thinking about all these things driving up the road to Stormont. And uh, I got there. We also had uh, gathered up a lot of children, Protestant and Catholic children. And we arrived and we started to sing. Maybe you'd sing it with me. Carry on, carry on. You can hear the people singing. standing by your castle in the hopeful Belfast breeze with a new song for your table to try again for peace. Carry on, carry on, you can hear the people singing. Carry on, carry on, 
little peace will come again. Suddenly I realized that the politicians had stopped talking and started to walk out. And I asked them to sing with me. And the women's coalition, they weren't but afraid to sing. The men were a bit reluctant. I would sing. Carry on, they sing, carry on, carry on, carry on. But the women's coalition, I sing, carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. You can hear the people singing. Try this time. Carry on, carry on, till peace will come again. And I was just looking around the people who were there. I saw Gusty Spence, who had been in prison way back in the 60s for shooting some Catholics. I saw Billy Hutchison, who had also had shot a couple of people. I saw various people from the IRA. I saw an old school teacher of mine who used to teach history, who had become involved in politics, a man called Frank Feely. He was singing too. And suddenly there's great things happening. I saw Seamus Mallon, who had later become the deputy prime minister. I remember Seamus well. He was a barman in the local pub at home. Carry on, carry on. You can hear the people singing. I want to hear this time. Carry on, carry on. Lovely, great. Till peace will come again. Walked away from that place. The children didn't want to go home. We knew that peace was going to be slow. The peace was like a little child that'll slip and stumble many times before he learns to walk. But at that moment, we believed the peace would dance. And things are much better today. We have still a journey to go. But the Good Friday Agreement is regarded by some as a masterpiece of deceit. All the people regarded it as a, a masterpiece of positive ambiguity. But at least it gives us the opportunity to let the bleeding stop and the healing to begin. Well, during this time, uh, we tried to make there are many initiatives by people. Because things were getting so bad that ordinary people were caught up in the whole conflict without wanting to be, as all wars, it happens in all wars. I'll sing you a little bit of a song. Uh, maybe you'd help me, Fanon, please. Uh, it's, it's a song about uh, the people who used to come to our house. They were both Catholics and Protestants. And they used to take part in the musical events. Then, one night, one of them was shot. And we knew there was going to be retaliation for it. I sang for you this evening. It's not to make you sad. Now for adding to the sorrows of this troubled northern land. Lately I've been thinking it just won't leave my mind. To tell you of the two friends one time who were both good friends of mine. There were roses, roses, there were roses. Well, fear had filled the countryside, there was fear in every home, and a car of death came prowling round the lonely Ryan Road. A 
Catholic would be killed tonight to even up the score. Oh Christ, it's Young O'Malley that they're taken from the door. Alan was my friend, he cried. He begged them with his fear. Centuries of hatred and ears that cannot hear. An eye for an eye was all that filled their mind. And another eye for another eye till everyone is blind. There were roses, roses. song for you this evening it's not to make you sad not for adding to the sorrows of this troubled northern land but lately I've been thinking and it just won't leave my mind to tell you of two friends one time who were both good friends of mine I don't know where the moral is or where the song should end but I wonder just how many wars are fought between good friends and those who give the orders are not the ones to die it's Bell and O'Malley on the likes of you and I there were roses roses there were roses the tears of much. I'll sing you one more song. This is a song that I wrote with the help of Pete Seeger, a wonderful American, a wonderful man, a great man. I'm sure most people have heard of him, I'm sure. Uh, and as Stan mentioned, we had a big birthday party for him in Madison Square Garden a few years ago. And uh, I mentioned earlier on, it, it was a, a little bit daunting. Fanon, my son and my daughter Maya, was with me, and uh, people, like, a lot of very wonderful, well-known people were there. Tim Robbins, who's an actor, was the MC, and uh, I asked Tim, I was sitting in the dressing room tuning, I said, uh, when are we on? And he says, uh, I guess, he says, he looked at the sheet, he says, you're on just after Chris Christopherson and before Bruce Springsteen, no pressure. <laughs> and, uh, but there wasn't any pressure, because people left their egos at the door anyway. And it is, it is a lovely event. But anyway, this is a song that I wrote with Pete. He lives in a small log cabin on the high banks of the Hudson River. And uh, I think he's a national treasure of America. You know, sometimes around the world, when people talk about America, they don't think about George Bush or these people. The influence of Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie has been much more important than any of these people. I was in Palestine not too long ago on a, in a lift that were singing songs of Pete Seeger. And uh, in from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to Gaza to Ramallah. But anyway, I said, you know, Pete, we're talking about how songs can sometimes heal wounds between people, break down barriers, even resolve conflicts in one's own head. And I said to Pete, you know, somebody should write a song about that. Pete says, you write it. I came back a few months later and I sang a song I'd written. And he stood up all six foot, two and a half inches of himself and looked out through the window at the Hudson below and he says, it's good, but it's too short. It needs another verse. He says, you write it, which he did. And we recorded this song together on an album called The Hearts of Wonder. 
And Brethren Smilovich, the cellist from Sarajevo, is also honored with us.
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. How has Christy Moore influenced you, or have you influenced him? I know you're both uh, big advocates for Ireland and uh, getting your message across. He's from Kildare, you're from Northern Ireland, so is your message the same or different? Yeah, well, you know, I know Christy very well, down through the years, and uh, I suppose he comes from the south of Ireland, and, uh, but of course he'd have great interests in the north. And probably some of his songs would have been slightly different to my songs. Uh, but he's, he's a great singer and a great songwriter, and uh, probably just a slightly different angle on things, slightly. All throughout your life, you said that music is a part of you, as it is a part of all of us. Um, is there any, or was there any doubt in your mind any time when you were fighting for the peace through your music uh, that the music wouldn't be able to bring the people together? Did that ever cross your mind, or were you always confident that the music could shine? Well, I was always confident that it could, given the right situation. Actually, there's a seminar that we do each year now called The Music of Healing, which is after that song. And uh, in it, during the time when people wouldn't talk to each other, the politicians wouldn't talk to each other, we used to have uh, create an event of music which would bring about a situation of humanity and neighborliness and invite the politicians along. And in that situation, I found that they did talk. In fact, not all that very long ago, we had a uh, an event where we were making a presentation to Pete Seeger. Pete wasn't able to come over himself, because he's 93 now, but this was a few years ago, and Tao came over, his grandson, I don't know whether you know Tao or not, he's a great singer. And uh, I knew that Jerry Adams is a big uh, fan of Pete Seeger, and I invited Jerry down to, to do the, the uh, award giving. But I thought, that wouldn't be right, that we, uh, we needed both sides to be represented. So I asked uh, uh, one of the DUP hardline men, uh, that's Ian Paisley's party, a uh, man called Jeffrey Donaldson, to come. And uh, Jeffrey says, is Jerry Adams coming? I said, yeah. He says, well, don't ask me to shake hands with him, because I won't. And I says, well, uh, why not? He says, well, Two of my cousins were shot by the IRA, and I don't want to shake hands with Jerry Adams. And uh, Jerry Adams, he had been shot himself by loyalists. Loyalists, in fact, there's still bullets in him. But anyway, we had a little discussion that came, and I sat here, and Jerry was there, and Jeffrey was there. And it is, I didn't ask them to shake hands. And there's a TV camera there from the news to see what was going to happen. But at the end, I asked Tao to sing a song. And Tao started to sing, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? And suddenly I realized both Jerry Adams and Jeffrey Donaldson were singing the song. And people saw this on television and said, well, they don't have to shake hands if they can sing a song together. And there's tears in people's eyes. It's a powerful moment. But it was in that context that these things can happen. And of course, like a song is like a hand or a fist. You can do whatever with it. Like music itself can be uh, sorry, very aggressive. It can be what you want it to be. But I think of its nature and its essence, it's about harmony. And uh, I think you may be familiar with the Japanese photographer who's taken photographs of crystallized water and playing music to it and uh, to the water and the beautiful crystals that are formed by certain types of music and very 
angry, uh, uncomfortable looking shapes, if it's very aggressive music of a certain type. And we're, I don't know what percentage water we are, but quite a bit. So even physically, music has an effect, and scientifically. One last question. I was once at um, some uh, talk where somebody, an expert on the Middle East, was talking about the difference between the conflict in Palestine and, and Israel versus in Ireland, and tried to say that uh, the Irish conflict was mainly religious and the Palestine uh, conflict was a land issue. Um, I'm not sure I agreed with him, but I know you've performed in, in Jerusalem and so may have an interesting perspective on what, those, what makes those two conflicts intractable. Is one more likely to be solved than the other? What's similar or different about them? Well, I think it's a very good question indeed. The, the conflict in Ireland was often seen to be religious, but it wasn't really, you know, religion is used. People weren't throwing stones at each other over theological principles or transubstantiation or anything like that. It was just a convenient label, I think. Uh, strangely enough, I was talking to one of the, the, the hunger strikers actually survived, and I said, what was it that changed things in your opinion about uh, how a peace process came about in Ireland? He said it was the fall of the Berlin Wall. I said, how did that happen? How, how could that be? And he, he said that, the excuse for Britain being in Ireland was always a security one. Uh, from the Spanish to the French to the time when the Republic of Ireland was neutral, it wasn't in NATO. Neither Britain nor America wanted a united free Ireland because of that. Uh, when the Berlin Wall went down, uh, the British Secretary of State said that Britain is no longer any strategic our political interest in Northern Ireland, and that's when it changed. Before that, Northern Ireland could not become part of the United Ireland until the majority in Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, it, was, it wasn't that. It would remain British as long as the majority said so, but it didn't say that it could be Irish if the majority said so, but after that, it did. And that's what brought about the Good Friday Agreement. It had the backing of America. It had the backing of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton put a lot of work into it. The Middle East doesn't have the backing of America. I, I think that's the problem. I, that I, I feel that the only people who can, the Palestinians can't change anything. They can't do anything. They're powerless. Israel has got the power. And I suppose, ultimately the responsibility uh, to do it. I think Obama is not able uh, to, to move things in the Middle East because there's not the will to do it. Uh, it's a very sad situation and uh, I think that's one of the big differences. America was for the peace process in Ireland. It's not for the peace process in the Middle East. And America is a big power, I think. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Tommy again and phone in.